kids. Welcome to this week's children's feature. Today we're talking about temptation. Do you ever get tempted? We all get tempted sometimes. Did you know that even Jesus got tempted? Check out our scripture reading for today. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. The temptation of Jesus. Then Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he ate nothing, and he became very hungry. Then the devil came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, change these stones into loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, he orders his angels to protect you, and they will hold you with their hands to keep you from striking your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, Do not test the Lord of your God. Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, and showed him the nations of the world and all their glory. I will give it all to you, he said if you will only kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. The scriptures say, you must worship the Lord God, serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and cared for Jesus. It's a pretty intense story. Satan was really going after Jesus, trying to get him to do things that were wrong. Sometimes temptation can be super strong in our life. There are things that are really attractive that we would really like to do, but in our heart we know that they're not right. This is why I find what Paul said to the church in Corinth really encouraging. Listen to what he said. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, he says, The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So you see, kids, God will never let you be tempted beyond what you can stand and he will always provide a way out. You don't have to give in. So the next time that you're feeling tempted, look for that way out. Another thing that Jesus said to his disciples when he was teaching them how to pray, he told them to pray to God, to ask God to help them to resist temptation and to not give in to temptation. And that should be something that we are praying for regularly, that God would give us the strength through his Holy Spirit to overcome the temptation that comes our way. So here is what I would like you to do with your family today. I'd like you to pause and discuss. What are some of the areas where you experience temptation? And then spend some time praying together asking God to give you the strength to overcome temptation in your life. Well kids, thanks for joining with me today. And I want you to know that next Sunday, August 1st, we will be beginning the first step in starting our children's ministry back up in our in-person services. And we will be offering a class for kids ages one to five. So that starts on August 1st next week and I hope to see you there in person. We'll see you next time.
Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. And before I get started, I just wanted to let you know that we are in progress to hopefully hire another staff person. But in the meantime, we've got a gap with our youth ministry. And if youth is something that you feel called to help with, if you have some leadership gifts, if you want to invest in the next generation of followers of Jesus, this could be your opportunity. We are looking for some leadership. And if you would like to maybe learn more about that, ask some questions, get a hold of me or get a hold of the office and we will get back to you on that. Looking for someone starting September. Okay, let's dive in. Have you ever started a story with the phrase, back in my day? <laughs> well, if you get to a certain age, you kind of do a lot, it seems. And I've, I've shared this story, but back in my day, we used to have diploma exams. And these exams were about two to three hours long, and they would count for 50% of your final grade. Imagine, you spend all year in a class but 50% of your grade is going to be decided in a two to three hour period. That's amazing. And these exams were so important that they would determine what schools you could get into, ultimately what careers you could get into. And if you bomb it, well, you've got two choices. You could either go back to studying and write it again, or you could accept your lot in life and move on. Now, part of the series, The Jesus I Never Knew, is the fact that Jesus also wrote a test. Well, not really wrote a test. It was more like he had an oral exam with the professor of dark arts, if you know what I mean. And he had to start with uh, his career with an exam too. Now, the reason I bring this up is because you and I face the same exam today. And it shapes, it's so important, our answers on this exam are so important that they shape who our friends are and what our priorities are and the very meaning of life as we see it. In other words, this exam shapes our life. It's shaping your life right now. And you might not even know it. Once you are familiar with these three tests, you will see them everywhere. I remember being introduced to this years ago and I remember it and I want to share it with you because once you know these tests, you're far more aware of the things that you are facing today. So we should dive in because this is really good stuff and I hope that you find this really helpful for you. So Jesus had just gotten baptized. Let's drop into his life according to Matthew's biography. This is what happens. Then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became hungry. Now, we know that Jesus, in order to come to the earth, he gave up his privileges as God. He became dependent. It says in the biographies of his life that he was empowered to do miracles by the Holy Spirit, and he was given words to say by the Father. So here he is. He's completely dependent on the Spirit and the Father for his ministry. And now he fasts to, to make sure that he is completely dependent on them, not dependent on himself. And he's about to start his three-part exam, completely dependent on the Father and Spirit. So let the examination begin. During that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, and this is just typical devil stuff. He wants you to not be too sure of who you are. Try this with Jesus too. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this brings us to the first test. Test one, pleasure. Test one is pleasure. Here was Jesus hungry, desperately in need, has a real physical want for food. And Satan says, hey, you've got a want for food? Make it happen. Indulge yourself. You've got a desire for something? Give in. Satisfy that desire. Treat yourself. Follow that want. It's only natural. Don't you see this everywhere? Satan tempting people to give in to their pleasures? Now, hedonism is making pleasure your God. 
And we probably wouldn't talk much about hedonism in 2021. Instead, we describe what we're after, our God, the what we center our lives around, as happiness. Happiness. Intellectual happiness, physical happiness, emotional happiness, whatever it is, shape your life around that. Make your life about happiness, about pleasure. It's a common sermon preached today. And I've collected just a couple memes. You know I love to do this. I collected some memes that show this very thing. Watch. Here's one. This one says, you'll know the people that feed your soul because you feel good after spending time with them. Get that. You know the people who make you feel good? The, the people who feed your soul, you'll feel good after you're with them. In other words, your life is about you and the goal of your life is to feel good. So you want to avoid people who make you feel uncomfortable or people who challenge you. Those are not the people you want to hang around with. Those are not the ones who feed your soul. The ones who really feed your soul make you feel good. Remember, we are not on a truth quest in 2021 in our culture. Not a truth quest. We are on a happiness quest. Here's a picture of a little girl in her dress and she's got quite the sass going on. It says, if it doesn't make you feel fabulous, don't do it, don't buy it, don't wear it, don't eat it, and don't keep it. Oh man, shape your whole life around pleasure, around your happiness. If it's, if it's an activity that makes you happy, do that. If it's clothing that makes you happy, do that. But if it's not making you happy, well, get rid of it. In fact, there are whole schools of thought to look around your at your belongings right now and if it's not making you happy, get rid of it. You dump it. Anything that's trying, anything that's difficult, anything that's requiring sacrifice, get rid of it. Dump it. Now, imagine if the church operated like this. Just just hold on. If the church operated like this, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Pretty much every ministry would shut down. Now, of course, serving other people can be very beneficial in the moment, can be very enjoyable in the moment. But it isn't always. Sometimes it's sacrifice. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes it can be kind of unpleasant, depending on what you're doing. And if we went with the theory, if it doesn't feel good, get rid of it, don't do it. Man, think about all the things in the church that would shut down. Ministry is so much like exercise. It may not feel good in the moment. I mean, I exercise. It doesn't feel good in the moment. But you do it for what comes afterwards, the rewards that come afterwards. The character, in this case, when it comes to ministry, the character that's developed as a result. But you may not feel good in the moment. New York Magazine ran an article some years ago called Happiness 101. I referred to this before. And in it, they talked about positive psychology, where they used scientific method to determine what actually makes people happy. And what they found was the opposite of what they expected to find. They expected to find that people who sought happiness, who went after happiness, those were the people who were the most happy. But instead, they said those are the people who got on what they called a hedonic treadmill where the more addicted to pleasure as some, someone became, the more they needed and the less satisfying pleasure became. And you know what they actually found made people happy? This is so surprising. It surprised me when I read it. They said what actually makes people happy is helping others. Selfless kindness. That's not what they expected to find. So pleasure was not something that Jesus was going to center his life around. Jesus passed the test. Let's move on. See, this story is not over. It says, Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, there it is again, jump off, for the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. And Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. 
This brought us to test number two, which is popularity. That's right, popularity. Imagine this scene where Satan says, takes Jesus to the highest point in the temple and says, throw yourself down and, and imagine what kind of Instagram influencer Jesus would be. He'd be the Instagram influencer of a decade if he came off the highest point in the temple and angels just kind of helped float him all the way down. Man, that would be amazing. That would be absolute proof that God exists. It would be the same as God writing, I love you in the sky. This is huge news. It would make Jesus very popular and we love popularity we love our likes and for many popularity is their god but maybe it comes out in ways that we kind of don't think about but parents can worship popularity when they don't discipline their kids when they want their kids to just kind of be their friend that's worshiping popularity pastors can worship popularity when they don't confront their congregation when they kind of steer away from the tough passages and just talk about God's love and, and how it doesn't really matter what they do. That, that's worshiping popularity. Or same thing with your friends when you never speak up and say what's really on your mind. Maybe you're just worshiping popularity. And today, sticking with the historical worldview the biblical worldview with morals and values, man, that is not going to be popular. You're probably going to be told you need to update your faith. You need to get with it. Uh, some may encourage you to be an echo of the culture instead of an alternative to the culture. Well, you know, it wasn't popular when Christians came along and said you shouldn't have gladiator fights and there shouldn't be slavery and we should save orphans and we should care for the sick. And the sexual ethic? Oh, that's never been popular. And it cost John the Baptist his life. I'm going to talk more about that in a few weeks. But why would Christians do that? Why would they risk being so unpopular? Well, frankly, because popularity was not their God. They didn't center their lives around being popular. Now, that's not a call to become obnoxious. You know, the, the gospel message is offensive enough. Jesus was always truthful without being obnoxious, without being arrogant. And I think, honestly, this is one of the things that I loved most about Jesus, is it just he was so secure. He, was, he is the most secure person I have ever met because it didn't matter if people didn't approve of him. It didn't matter if, if people thought he was a little off his rocker. It didn't seem to faze him. It seemed like he was just fine. Why? because he didn't worship popularity. He didn't embrace popularity as the most important thing. In fact, he considered himself to be hated. I've read a lot of times where Christians will say, you know, if we really behaved like Jesus, we'd be way more popular. Well, Jesus never saw himself as popular. He said he was hated because he confronted people with, with their sins. So clearly Jesus did not worship popularity. But Satan was not done. One more test to go. Here we go. It says, Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said. And if you will kneel down and worship, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. This brought us to test number three, which was power. Power. Worship me and I will put you in control. Oh, that is so tempting for us today. You know, we are so unhappy when our friend, our spouse, our teacher, our church, our boss, our government doesn't put me in charge. I should be in charge. I know what's best. I want to be God. I don't want to have to trust other people or depend on other people and yet think about the things just the things that we don't control in the first second of our lives we don't control who our parents are we don't control the place of our birth whether we have siblings how many siblings what order of those siblings we don't control the color of our skin 
We don't control our gifts or our talents that we have, our social status, our economic status, or our appearance. We control none of those things. The message is in the first second of life, you are not in control. <laughs> oh man. And so Jesus reminded the tester, Satan, that the world doesn't revolve around me. It revolves around God. Now, say, Jesus could have probably said the world revolves around him, but he pointed back to God and said, no, the world is about God. And we would do well to remember the same. Abraham Lincoln said this famously, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Give him power. And history has proven, quite frankly, that not even the church can handle power. It's true. So many atrocities that the church has been involved in. But you know, that just goes to show that we all need to be rescued. Even people in the church, we all need to be saved. Now, why is all this important? What difference does this all make? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you and I are facing these same three tests every single day. And one might be a little more tempting to you than the other. Pleasure, popularity, or power. And if you worship one of these, here's the thing. Let, if we, let's just go down one, one level. If you worship one of these three things, along with each of these gods comes a fear. A very specific fear that you might be experiencing right now. What do I mean? Okay, well, let's get into specifics. So first of all, if you worship the God of pleasure, then you are going to greatly fear loss. You're going to fear loss, loss of your health, your job, your family, your money, whatever gives you pleasure, whatever makes you happy, it will not just make you sad. To lose it will devastate you because your God is gone, that pleasure is gone so you will constantly be anxious about losing things like your health like your job all those things can be taken away and you will never experience peace as long as you are worshiping pleasure could it because it can all disappear tomorrow but what if you worship the god of popularity well if you worship the god of popularity the fear that comes along with that is the fear of people you will worry about other people's opinions You'll desire accolades and approval. Try to get their attention. You'll fear doing the wrong thing in front of them. You'll be permanently attached to the approval meter. And you'll lose yourself in the desire to please them. In fact, it may make you simply avoid the truth in your relationships. You won't care about being on the wrong side of history down the road, you'll care about being on the wrong side of the most current trend when you want to be popular. So you'll always fear people and what they think of you. And what if your God is power and you just want power? Well, you will always fear change because every change, especially change that is forced upon you, change that you didn't uh, endorse will remind you that you are not God and you are not in control. COVID-19 has brought this about in such a remarkable way because along the, the political spectrum is nothing but fear. On one end, you've got people who are deathly afraid of sickness, of disease, of dying, terribly, terribly afraid that they are not going to be in control. On the other hand, you've got people who are deathly, deathly afraid of being controlled by the government, by the media. And so they are fearful. They want to be in control. Both sides desperately wanting to be in control. Both sides desperately want power. They want to have power over their lives. And so they will always be afraid of change. Both sides. Jesus was the most fearless human being that there ever was. And, and that's because he had this crazy idea that to believe truths that no one else really believes today. 
when it came to pleasure, he said he thought the single greatest pleasure is knowing the Father. And that took him away from the fear of loss. There's nothing that could be taken from him because the father's relationship was always there for him. The single greatest pleasure I can experience is knowing the father. Think of the freedom that's found in that. When it came to popularity, he said, I want the approval of only one, just my father. That's the only approval that Jesus wanted. And it made him absolutely unafraid of people. It didn't matter to him uh, if people didn't approve of him, if they hated him. He was okay as long as the father approved. And finally, when it came to power, he believed my father is the most qualified to run my life. Oh, that just released him from the fear of change and it released him uh, from the fear of the cross. He trusted the Father, even with his life. He said, because the Father is the most qualified to run my life. Now let's drill down one more layer, because these tests will determine your sense of connectedness as well. The more we worship pleasure, popularity, and power, the more our lives revolve around ourselves. And the more our lives revolve around ourselves, the more disconnected and alone we become. We become lonely, our lives become unfulfilling. It's happening right now. The more we worship these idols, pleasure, popularity, and power, the more distance we, we have between us. You know, we wonder why people are so isolated, so alone, and we don't recognize, well, when you worship pleasure, popularity, or power, your life becomes all about you. And when your life is all about you, your relationships are strained. Jesus said you cannot be truly connected to another person without laying down your life for them. That's what love truly is. It's why Jesus said you must lay down your life. All of me for all of you. That's the only way to have intimacy. It's the only way to be truly connected to someone. The worship of pleasure, power, and popularity breaks down community it breaks down marriages it breaks down families and churches it's probably breaking relationships in your life right now because you are worshiping one or more of those idols and you are centering your life around them right now wherever you see strains in relationships you can you can go to one of those three idols that's how important this is i was listening to an interview not that long ago uh, by Kerry Newhoff, and he was interviewing Gary Chapman. Now, you might not recognize any either of those names. You don't need to know Kerry Newhoff for now. I can talk about that later. But Gary Chapman is the guy who wrote the book Five Love Languages. You heard of that? Probably many of you have. Amazingly, in the interview, I found out that that book sells more copies every year than the last year. It has been around for, I think, think all, maybe a couple decades at this point and every year it keeps selling more and more copies but it was the interview that really interested me because Carrie asked Gary a really important question he says what is the worst marriage advice you ever heard commonly given to people now I was interested what is the worst advice Gary tell me and his answer kind of floored me he said I think the worst concept is to be happy. You deserve to be happy. And if you're not happy in your marriage, go find somebody who will make you happy. Marriage alone, he said, is never going to make you happy. Happiness comes essentially, and this is it right here. Happiness comes essentially from investing your life in helping people. And it starts in your marriage. I'll read that again. Happiness comes essentially from investing your life in helping people and it starts in your marriage. In other words, happiness won't come from the gods of pleasure, popularity, or power. To be fulfilled as a human being means to give your life for each other. You know, one of the great concerns, <laughs> you might not know this, one of the great concerns of pastors these days as we're coming out of COVID 
is the number of people who kind of got used to not serving, kind of got used to not sacrificing for their church. And so now they're saying, yeah, I kind of don't want to go back and serve here or serve there or do that anymore. And it's, it's a real problem. And it comes back to that whole idea of, well, we are worshiping pleasure, power, or popularity. Any one of those will make us not want to invest in other people, will make us not want to care for others and sacrifice for others. And yet Jesus was the most fully alive human being and he gave everything for others. These gods will dog us. They create tension in our relationships right now, in our friendships, our family, our church. And all those tensions can be traced right back to these gods. See, the tests that Jesus took is a test that you and I are taking right now. Jesus took this test to show us that with dependence, remember, he was depending on the Father and the Spirit, that with dependence, we can destroy these idols. And Jesus used God's word and God's grace to deflect these idols. Which is why as a church we study God's word. And why as a church part of our vision statement is everyone growing in grace. Because we need these things if we are going to defeat pleasure, power, and popularity in the Nanaimo Alliance Church. And when we do, and as we do, by his grace and by the power in his word, it leads to ultimate life. It leads to ultimate life. Giving our lives for each other. Jesus said it is more blessed which means happy. It is more happy to give than to receive. And this brings us to the cross. The cross is the final rejection in Jesus' life of pleasure, popularity, and power. Jesus accepted the pain, not the pleasure. He accepted the rejection, not the popularity. And he accepted the loss of control, powerlessness for you, for love. He triumphed over the idols that you and I fall prey to all too often. He showed in a sense, I don't want to be careful, but he showed in a sense how to worship the Father, how to give the Father worth by saying it's your will that needs to be done. One of the scriptures Jesus used, he said, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. This is the essence of saying no to all those idols. Worship of him alone is the only hope to keep us away from the fear of loss, the fear of people, and the fear of change. It is the only way to true life. And so I'd ask in this moment of quiet, as you watch this, that you would just change the wording just a little bit to this. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. Remember, Jesus taught us to, to pray as a group. So I'm giving this to you in the communal sense. We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. Can you say that right now in this moment? We will worship the Lord our God and serve only him. Not pleasure, not power, and not popularity. And we, in that service, in that worship of God, will serve others and give our lives for others the way that Jesus did. That's your calling as a follower of Jesus. That's your life, and it is the pathway to the truest life, the greatest life, and ultimately, happiness. Let's pray. Lord, you know how easily we give in to pleasure, power, and popularity. All of us, everyone watching this, is serving one of those gods in some fashion. Lord, I ask that you'd continue to free us from these idols so that we could be free of the fears that come with them. That we could live fearless lives the way Jesus lived his life. May we be a new generation of 
fearless followers of Jesus who will give anything in our worship to you as we serve and love and adore only you, our King. We ask this in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Take care, everyone.